Take a moment to consider how much of our lives are controlled by time. We work certain hours, go to school on a schedule, eat meals at set times and plan our activities around timetables. Mass transportation such as airlines and trains are completely time-driven. From getting up in the morning to going to bed at night, time dictates much of our daily routines and the structure of our days. We rush from one appointment to the next, always mindful of the clock. In many ways, we have become slaves to time. Clocks are everywhere in our lives. In my own home, I counted no fewer than 20 devices that tell the time, be it a thermostat, a computer, a phone, a microwave, etc. Clocks are so ubiquitous that we don't appreciate the fact that centuries ago, you might be lucky to find one clock per town. The evolution of the clock is fascinating, none more so than the wristwatch. Please join us as we explore the evolution of the clock leading up to the birth of the wristwatch being our moment in history called the first wristwatch of 1810. Man's obsession with time is reflected by the number of ingenious ways to track the passage of time throughout history. As early as 1200 BC, Egyptians used water clocks and sundials to tell the time. The Chinese employed incense clocks, which used specially calibrated incense sticks that burned at a consistent rate. Europeans used candle clocks, much like the incense clocks, but the hourglass was the simplest and most reliable timekeeper, especially at sea. With the exception of the sundial and some of the more complex water clocks, all of these devices simply measured elapsed time. They did not tell the time of day directly. And even the sundial had its limitations. The most obvious being that it only worked when there was enough sunlight to cast a shadow. And all of these methods of measuring time were cumbersome, inaccurate, and not readily available to the general populace. As the lives of men and women became more complicated, the need for accurate and reliable timekeeping was more and more important. Mechanical clocks arrived in Europe in the late 13th century. This design used a weight-driven escapement, a mechanical linkage that moves a gear at a fixed, consistent rate. A gear is forced to rotate via a weight, but its movement is regulated by a foliot, which swings back and forth, allowing the gear to rotate one tooth at a time. This movement is consistent enough to measure time. These early clocks did not have a clock face, so you could not tell the time at a glance. Instead, they would typically ring a bell at hourly intervals. The use for these types of clocks were predominantly for the church, whose lives revolved around prayers and songs prescribed throughout the day at regular intervals. It's interesting to note that during these early years of the clock, there were no clockmakers. These clocks were very crude and primitive and were the art of blacksmiths, they were so wildly inaccurate that they had to be reset regularly via a sundial. And, to keep our subject of watches in sight, these clocks were not even remotely portable. The invention of the mainspring in the early 15th century marked a major milestone in clock development. A mainspring is a metal ribbon which, when wound up tightly, can store enough energy to drive the internal gears of a clock. This invention allowed clocks to become much smaller by foregoing the large system of weights and pulleys. The mainspring allowed clock development to diverge. On one path, clockmakers continued improving the standard clock with a pendulum, making them more accurate. But these large clocks would forever be bound to clock towers and home foyers. The other path of clock development focused on making clocks smaller and portable. German clockmakers in the early 16th century are credited with inventing the first portable clocks. It is around this time the word watch enters our vocabulary. Though we're uncertain of its origins, the prevailing theory is that it comes from the word for a night watchman, who needed to keep track of the time for their shifts. The early watches were still large by today's standards, the shape of drums or eggs. They were fastened to clothing, worn on a chain around the neck or carried in a handbag. They only had an hour hand with rudimentary alarm features and most had to be wound twice a day. Unfortunately, unlike the larger pendulum clocks, these early watches took a step backwards in regards to accuracy. They were practically useless in telling the time. The accuracy of their internal movements was so poor that many would lose or gain several hours each day, 
the use of these early watches was mostly as curious jewellery for nobility. Clocks were no longer the bailiwick of blacksmiths, for now there were dedicated watch and clockmakers who made the delicate craft their livelihood. In the mid-1500s, the watchmaking industry got a boost from Switzerland. As Calvinism took over the country, jewellery was banned, putting hundreds of jewellers out of work. This redirected them towards watches, and the infamous Swiss watch industry was born. Despite the improvements made and miniaturization, the watch was still a pendant, dangling from one's neck or clipped to one's outer clothing. But in the mid-1600s, the pendant watch was able to migrate into a pocket, thanks to a surprising advocate of men's fashion, King Charles II of England. Charles introduced the waistcoat, an adorned vest worn under the jacket, and he deemed it a necessary piece of fashion. The waistcoat had a cleverly placed pocket. Thus was born the pocket watch, a flattened round watch with a cover stowed in a waistcoat's pocket, tethered with a chain. So successful were these pocket watches that they would be the standard portable clock for men, enduring for nearly three centuries. Pocket watches were for men only, as women did not wear waistcoats, and they had no convenient pocket to stow their watches. Therefore, women continued to wear their watches as pendants. One woman wanted to change that. She was Napoleon Bonaparte's sister, Caroline Murat, Queen of Naples. She commissioned Abraham Louis Breguet, a Prussian horologist, to build for her a watch to wear upon the wrist. Breguet was already an established watchmaker, introducing many innovations over the years. His clientele were the noble celebrities of the day, such as Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Napoleon Bonaparte and the Duke of Wellington. His Breguet watch company continues even now as the luxury watch division of the Swiss watch group. Breguet designed Caroline's wristwatch in 1810, and he delivered the final product modestly called the Breguet watch number 2639, marking the first ever wristwatch. We unfortunately do not know exactly what it looked like, but the watch shown here resembles the style of Breguet's watch. From the company archives, we know that it was an exceptionally thin, oval repeater watch with complications, mounted on a wristlet of hair and gold thread. Breguest's records indicate that the watch was brought in for repairs in 1849 by Caroline's youngest daughter, Louise. The watch reappeared again in 1855 for more repairs, but the watch has since disappeared and never to be seen again. The wristwatch caught on quickly, and by the 1850s, most watchmakers were producing a range of wristwatches. Before we end, the wristwatch has an interesting epilogue. As noted before, men were entrenched with the pocket watch and would continue wearing them into the 20th century. They found the wristwatch a feminine piece of jewellery and had no interest in them. However, World War I would gradually change men's perception of wristwatches. Trench warfare evolved a tactic called the creeping barrage. This called for an artillery barrage on enemy trenches to be quickly followed up by infantry moving in to secure the area. This tactic required precise synchronization between the artillery and infantry, but holding a pocket watch in the trenches proved to be impractical. Wrist watches were far more convenient, especially with the modifications for the rigors of the trenches, the addition of luminous dials and unbreakable glass covers. The wristwatch also gained favour with pilots and naval officers due to its hands-free convenience, but the United States still had sceptics. In 1918, the New York Times called men wearing wristwatches a silly-ass fad. By the end of the war, nearly all soldiers wore a wristwatch. When these soldiers returned home, they kept wearing their watches. The fad now became fashion, and the rugged trench wristwatch was mass-produced by numerous companies. It took a couple more decades, but the 1930s saw the end of the pocket watch. The wristwatch has continued to evolve over the last century. They have moved from mechanical internals to electronic and analogue dials to digital. With all the technological advancements, there is a touch of irony. With the rise in popularity of smartphones, wristwatch usage declined from 13 to 20% due to the smartphone providing the same timekeeping functionality. As most people carry smartphones in their pockets, many people went back to what were essentially pocket watches. Thank you for watching this moment in history. If you liked this episode, please like and subscribe.